So uh, I'm going to tell this story, and I've told it before, but I'm going to go ahead and tell it again because I think it speaks to, to, what, um, to what I think this message might be about, what our text is about. But more than that, it's also kind of an interesting way of looking at stories, like, like the Scripture. You know, uh, stories, poetry, art, um, creative expression. We get fixed in how we see a thing, right? And, and, and even like our worship experience in here, we get fixed in how we see things. And they become ingrained, they become Im- embedded in our neurology as well as in just how, how we uh, live out our lives then. And so it's, it's always interesting to me how you can see something completely different that you've always seen for so long. So here's that story. So a kid, a, a small kid, um, walks into his um, uh, uh, room one day and he sees that his turtle is, um, is, has, has died. It's, it's laying on its back. And he, he shakes the, 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 ter- the terrarium, whatever it's called, the little ca- turtle cage. He shakes it a little bit, and, and, um, and, and, he, and the turtle just doesn't move. And so he goes and he tells his parents, and he's completely distraught. And, and his parents try to teach him a little bit about death and dying, but that seems to make matters worse. And he just starts crying harder and starts weeping more. And he wants the turtle, and it's gone. And so the, his family's trying to help him kind of bridge this reality. And so they begin to say, you know what, we'll have a funeral service for him. We'll have a special service for him, and, and we'll remember him. We'll remember all the things that little turtle, you know, did for us and how he made us laugh and such and how he's just, he just inspired us. And, but the boy was inconsolable. He continued to cry, and so the father got creative and said, well, well, we'll invite some friends to come over and participate in it. And some of your friends can be here, and they can remember little turtle for who he was and everything and how much he meant to you. And wouldn't that be nice? And he shook his head, nodded his head, but he was still crying and, and just kind of weeping. And they thought, like, well, we got to do something else. And so the father said, well, and we can invite them to bring gifts for you in honor of little turtle. <laughs> and, and then he started to calm down for a minute, and his face kind of lit up a little bit. And he said, really, can we have cake? Too? And the dad said, sure, we'll have a celebration for him and we'll bring presents and we'll have cake and it'll be a great party. And the boy smiled and wiped his tears and looked down at the little cage, the little box, and just then the turtle suddenly flipped back over <laughs> onto all four legs, to which the, the son immediately looked at his dad and said, kill it! So what I want to think with you about is do we really know what we want? Are we sure, in fact, that we haven't betrayed ourselves and that we don't betray ourselves every day? We see it played out in politics this week, but it's played out in politics all the time. The sides have become so divisive, right? They can't even come to any decision on what to do, and so it shuts down when we know it'll probably come around eventually, but it's just this ongoing sort of split. And we see it in the church as we struggle with our, hum- our issues over human sexuality and what will the church look like. But then you start thinking about denominations in general, right? And I got to looking on the, uh, the uh, uh, Wikipedia yesterday because I was started thinking, just how many denominations are there anyway? Because I knew there must have been, you know, a hundred or a couple hundred or something like that. But the, the Wikipedia says there are 33,000 different denominations, now, granted, that includes the little tiny ones that include just you and me, and we go off and we do our own little thing because everybody else in the world is wrong, but there's still these tiny little denominations and these fractions of denominations and these factions of fractions of denominations. And when I was going to seminary, one of my favorite ones to explore was with a good friend of mine who's now a, a dean of the Pacifica School of Religion. He's particularly the dean over the Swedian Borgian School of Religious Studies at the Pacifica School of Religion outside of, in, in, in San Francisco. Now, the Sweden, Swedenborg was a 17th century reformist around the time of, Martin, uh, around the time of, of uh, Wesley, a little bit before Wesley, but he was a Swedish reformer and, and actually quite a scientist and quite a literary genius, but also had a strange experience of an otherworldly kind that he began to interpret scripture based on this otherworldly experience. If you were to go to a Swedenborgian church, once you got past the name, right, you would think, well, this isn't a whole lot different than the other Protestant churches I've been to. 
But then if you start talking to them about their ideas and their doctrines and what they think about heaven and hell, and you start reading Swedenborg's whole volumes of his reinterpretation of the Bible, and then you start thinking, oh my gosh, this is so different from what I, I think, what I believe. Now, I happen to think it was really fascinating, and I loved the school because their school up in Boston is like going to Hogwarts. You know, so I just wanted to go study because you got to sit in the guy's office while he smoked a pipe and there was a fire going over in the big stone fireplace and you were talking about ideas and I'm like, I just want to be here, you know, and but but of course there's only like 15 churches in the United States and so it didn't have much promise and so I became a Methodist. <laughs> That's really not exactly how I got there. Um, but there's this idea that do we really know what it is we want? Or do we want something else and we're just not thinking? We want what we think, but not what we really want. So I, I, this book called The Anatomy of Peace by the Arbinger Institute, some of you all have read this. I know some of our classes here have studied this. Some of our ministers have done a study of this. And it asks an interesting question. I think it's fascinating, number one, that it's not written by an individual, but it's written by a group of people who came together from different backgrounds to think about what is it that makes for peace? How do we create peace in a divisive reality or in divisive homes or in divisive workspaces? How do we create peace? And early on, it asked this one all-encompassing question that I think speaks very much to the text as well as it speaks to this joke that I just told. What if the conflicts at home or the conflicts at work or the conflicts in the world all stem from the same root cause? What if the conflicts that we all experience or that we see being experienced everywhere else or that we see being played out in the media, what if all of these conflicts all stem from the same root cause? And what if we, as a result, systematically perpetuate the very problem we're trying to solve? So what they're saying is that if this is the case, then, in order to inspire change in the world, a fundamental change has to take place in us. And this tension that we laugh at with the joke about the boy and his turtle, I think we laugh at it because, it, like most jokes, it, it expresses an underlying truth, an underlying tension that exists in all of our relationships and in all of our experiences. And that tension is between what we think we want and what we really want, between who we think we are and who we think we want to be, which gets us back to that song at the beginning. Um, I want to make sure, who was that one? That was by um, Gavin DeGraw, yeah. I mentioned to some other people that we were going to do this song when I was out in L.A. this past week, and I said, we're doing a Gavin DeGraw song, and they were like, oh, that's awesome, which one? And I told them this one, and they were like, that's a great song. Boy, that song feels so empowering, you know, be who you're supposed to be. And it's like, yeah, but it's not who you think you're supposed to be. <laughs> that's the whole point. Or is it? I'll be the first to say I don't know that I have any answers, and if you came for answers, I'm sorry. You can patiently sit till the end of the show's over, and then you can make your way out, or, or you can perhaps sit back and go, eh, I'm okay if I don't get any answers today. But I did come with a lot of questions. There's an inner betrayal that takes place. So when we think about this idea of how to hold things together... I want to throw some things out at you that might kind of confuse you a little bit because it's still confusing me as I try to get my head around it. We tend to think of betrayal as this false, this, this um, lying, this, uh, this, this um, um, betraying of trust, this breaking of something. And I want to suggest to you that there's another way entirely, which is think of betraying as a way of breaking open. It occurred to me that when the young child in the emperor's new clothes stepped out of the crowd after the emperor had gone through this long, arduous process of everyone seeing what he wanted them to see, agreeing to see what everyone else was agreeing to see because of the same lie, that it was the, b b the boy or the girl, I can't remember which, that stepped out into the open and betrayed everyone by simply saying what was there. The emperor's naked. There's a sense in which betrayal breaks open. And that's what I want us to think about. 
One of the examples they give in this story, I mean in this book, uh, Anatomy Peace, is a small boy. It's told in the form of a story. The whole thing is told in the form, in the form of a narrative. And there's a story of, of a small boy, a young boy, who is Palestinian and poor. And he's going out and walking along the, the street and sees a Jewish beggar. Now, he sees the beggar. The beggar is obviously blind and, is, and has dropped some coins, but doesn't see where the coins are. And the first thing that occurs to the boy is that there's a beggar. And then he realizes he's Jewish. And then he thinks he can't see. So all sorts of things start to go through his mind when he thinks, perhaps I should go over and pick up the coins and put them back in his, in his little container there and tell him he dropped these coins. But then he remembers what the, 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 what the Jews have done to the Palestinians for, for years and the conflict that, that Israel and Palestine have with each other. And then he began to realize that if he didn't go over there, he started feeling guilty about not going over there because he's a beggar, like, much like himself, poor. They're in the same kind of boat in some ways, the same kind of existential reality, except that he's the enemy. And so he begins to justify this reality of why he didn't help because of his father and his father's father and the generations of suffering or generations of, of divisiveness between them. And he goes home and he begins to tell the story as if he has done the right thing and looking for approval until after some time he is now so deep into denial and yet everyone around him agrees with him. The author suggests something pretty profound. What was the first thought he had when he saw the beggar? What did he betray in order to deny? Is that, you following what I'm saying? Martin Buber says that we do this all the time. The great Jewish theologian and philosopher, uh, an existential philosopher, he said that we do this all the time. We tend to see relationships, whether it's to people, whether it's to things, whether it's to ideas which become things, right? Ideas and beliefs and whatnot become things, whether it's to traditions that become things. We do this all the time. We begin to see all of these as I and it. We objectify even when we say God is this way, how, how in the world can we even begin to claim God is this way? Well, enough people suggest it or enough people agree with me or maybe like I said, enough people like you and me, we believe God looks like us and not like them. And so enough of us sort of begin to solidify this betrayal of what is essentially true to begin with until after a while it becomes true. Am I still making sense? Am I? Because shake your head if I'm not, because I'm, I'm lost now, and I'm kind of confused. And <laughs> this is where I start getting lost, this idea of betrayal, because we think of betrayal as such a bad thing. We think of it as such an evil, when in fact, there's also this sense in which betrayal breaks us open. You know, we have all these different denominations, and it's interesting to me about these different denominations. The idea of denomination literally means to dename as that's what we should have been doing if we were practicing Old Testament faith in many ways, is the minute you name God, you have missed God. So God has many names. God has many realities. God has many ways of being because we can't really name the unnameable. But yet we do. And so we divide ourselves based on how we name God versus you. We literally dename the way you think and we become denominations. And we form this kind of essential divisiveness. Or as Martin Buber would say, we've already betrayed the essence of who we are. And what he says is that instead of I and it, what we are is I and thou. We are all part of this essential essence. We are all part of this essential being of God or this essential being of being or this essential being of God beyond God or this essential mystery that we can't really put our thumb on or our finger on, but we really want to because it's anxious not to. But we all exist there and then immediately we step away because it's uncomfortable perhaps or because of background or because of some other thing or because of what we wish we had maybe the present so kill the turtle after all you know it's it's we begin to identify with our fear as opposed to the possibilities beyond our fear some of you all remember um the story about bob dylan um 
I came across it not this past week as I was in L.A., and we were talking about um, folks that had come through town in the last year, and he was one of those who had come through and done a concert. And as you know, he recently won the, uh, the Nobel Prize for Literature. Odd thing that he had trouble grasping, grasping, grasping himself was this idea that a songwriter, particularly of his ilk, would win the Nobel Prize for Literature. But if you go back and you look at his history, there's a wonderful moment that happens, a moment of betrayal that happens in his life that really is profound when you look back and you think about your own lives and where we are with our life and where these moments might have happened. Because in 1965 to 1966, he produced like three of the albums. I could look over at Chuck, and I bet Chuck could name the three albums. No, okay, I'm sorry, I put you on the spot. Blonde on Blonde was one of them. No Going Back uh, was an... Bringing It All Back Home was another one. Highway 61 Revisited. That was the third one. He produced what has been considered some of his greatest works during those, that year and a half or so period. But it also marked another part of his life because he had gone from the protest songwriter, you know, Answer My Friend is Blowing in the Wind, Peter, Paul, and Mary, the brothers for the, country, the four countrymen, they all took his songs and were singing the protest songs of the early 60s. But he had suddenly turned to electric guitar. And as he was touring Europe for this first part of this world tour with his new songs, he would do the first half of his concert with the acoustic set, and everyone would love it. And they'd do the second half of the set with the electric guitar, and everyone would hate it. Not everyone, but a lot of folks. And there's this one famous concert that you music files, uh, music files, mu whatever, you lovers of music and history will know. You, it was in Manchester in May of 1966, he did a concert and he was performing, and there was all this rumbling going on. People sang along with the folksy front part of the, for the concert, but then when he brought out the electric guitar in the second half, started doing songs from his new albums, there was this discontentment that was going on. And it just got worse and worse. And towards the end of the concert, right before he did the grand finale, sort of his exit piece, um, he, uh, he got quiet, and, it got, and you can look it up on YouTube because it's a great example of, what, of, of this. It's, it's, it's right there on YouTube. Somebody videotaped the concert. And he turns around to the band to give them instructions when in the silence, someone in the crowd yells out, Judas! And then there's this rumbling in the crowd, like, yeah, yeah, boo! And there was this sort of hissing and this sort of rumbling. They like, you betrayer! And, and, and it's interesting because Bob Dylan turns around. He doesn't get mad. He turns around to the crowd in sort of semi-looking stoned fashion. I'm not sure if he's stoned or just he's in this mellow state all the time. He turns around and he says to the crowd, I don't believe you. And then he turns around and looks at the band and then he looks back one more time at the crowd and he says, you're a liar. And then he looks back at the band, and I can't really say what he said, but what he said was at that point he said to his band, play it loud. He said three words, you can fill in the middle word, but he said play it loud. And then the band, he'd been playing it, strumming it on the electric guitar, and then at that moment, you know what he said? Do you remember what he said? Yeah. Okay, anyway, um, so it turned around, and, and he said, um, and, he, and as he said that, the band slammed into it, and they just cranked it up, and they started singing this wild version of Like a Rolling Stone, with no direction home, right? And he started playing it like his whole being depended on it. And the crowd tried to kind of overwhelm him, and the band overwhelmed the crowd, and when it was all over, there was mixture of applause, and he walked off, he said, thank you, thank you, you know, and he waved as other people were kind of booing, and then he said, God save the queen, and he walked off the stage. <laughs> now, you wouldn't think about what that meant to him unless you read his biography or you looked at some of the articles about that years later because he, uh, Rolling Stones did a great article about this and interviewed about this. And he said up till that tour and during that tour he had undergone a deep existential crisis because he had literally moved from being this one person that everyone expected him to be to this other person that was still who he was and yet now it was being seen in a different way. Now he was seeing himself in a different way but he thought he was being true to himself and nobody was accepting it. And he came home in the middle of the concert and he said, I remember talking to a producer saying, I think I want to quit. I think I want to do something else. Maybe write, 
maybe even do write for plays, maybe write a book. He was thinking of other ways to be creative. And he said the moment that changed was at the Manchester concert when someone said, Judas. And he said, I turned around and looked at the band and realized, that's right. I am. I can be more of this. And he said, and it, and it propelled him, it compelled him deeper into who he had become. Until about 50 years later, he wins the Nobel Prize for literature. There's this sense of what betrays what. How do we be authentic? How are we authentic to who we are called to be in the midst of our living? How are we to hold together a reality of something deeper than the divisiveness that we exist in? When we have people all around us who will say, you're betraying this tribe, or you're betraying this point of view, or you even feel it yourself, I'm betraying my own tradition. How is it that we are to try to hold this all together Years ago, when I, when I was in the ministry in a local church, I've shared some aspects of that, but as I was in the ministry at a local church, I remember thinking I was preaching a sermon, and I'd been at it for eight years now, and I remember standing in front of the congregation in my robe, and, and I hope you'll take this for what it's worth and, and not make too much out of it, but I remember thinking after going through all of these iterations from being a fundamentalist to being evangelical, charismatic, and then finding myself in seminary, almost having been a Swedenborgian, and then ending up in the Methodist church and preaching at Methodist churches and I remember standing there in front of the congregation vividly one Sunday as I'm preaching and thinking to myself who's that guy who's that guy up there it was as if I was still sitting in the chair looking at the guy standing at the pulpit and I went home and I remember thinking to myself where did I get off track it suddenly occurred to me my whole journey was not about finding God or finding a better version of God. My journey was about finding a way to help people be better people, about finding a way to be more connected to one another. But the church wasn't necessarily there because the church was existing in this context of divisiveness and who and what you're supposed to believe and how you're supposed to believe and then how you're supposed to betray, portray that. And I couldn't face it. It terrified me. Because doing so felt like I was betraying something. Years and years later, I look back and I realize I was simply being broken open. I'll close with this, this um, statement by uh, Naomi Shehab Nye. She did a wonderful interview some, a year or two back on On Being, and I love On Being, as you all know. Naomi Shehab Nye said that we live in the world of poetry. And, they, and, and Krista Tippett asked her to, 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 uh, spe- to clarify that what she meant by that, and she said, we live in the world of poetry. We try to nail it down, but if we're open, we simply live with images and scenes and moments like pieces of a life that sometimes fit together and sometimes don't. Poetry doesn't force you to fit it together. Poetry doesn't insist that you make sense out of this. Poetry simply asks you to observe, to be present, and let the truth speak when it needs to speak. The minute you try to nail it down, the minute you try to say this is what it's saying, she says, most poets will look at you and say, that's not my poem. Most painters will say, that's not what I was trying to say. Picasso said, if you want to live with tradition, what you do is you could either wear the grandfather's hat and walk around with your grandfather's hat and it won't make you do anything or you can give birth to something and then you got to deal with it. Poetry is like that, Naomi, as she had nice said. Poetry is alive. It's growing, it's changing, and you just have to hold it. She said the best image came from a Japanese girl when she was in Japan, and the Japanese girl said this, which I thought was really interesting. I want you to walk with this, leave with this. She said, 
I have a word. She was a third grader. She says, I have a word that speaks to what you're teaching because she wrote it up on the board. Our lives are poetry. She says, I have a word. She says, the word in Japan is called yutori. And what it means is spaciousness. Around here, that pragmatically, the way it looks like is that you allow yourself time to arrive the next place early. Whether you're meeting somebody, whether you're going to work, whether you're driving to some destination, you allow yourself space and time. She says, not so that you get there on time, but so that you can sit for a while and take it all in. You Tory. I think that's what we're offered in this idea of what Paul says when he says to love with a sense of humility, to love with a sense of self-denial, to love with a sense of openness, to even love your enemies with a sense of compassion that reminds them they are as connected to what's real as you are connected to that same reality. You Tory, allowing that spaciousness for us all to live in, in that reality. Amen.